is the 4th of July 2019. Thanks for making time for us on NTV Tonight. These are our top stories. Tonight, celebrating Bob the man, the leader, the friend and inspiration. And the thing is, you're never too small to make a difference in this world. To the only man whom I loved and desperately want to live forever. Bob loved Kenya. He loved it as his home country. Also tonight, Kiambu finance executive resigns and spills the beans. Much of the public property has been transferred to private individuals. Armed men try to forcefully take her away, but the cameras saved her. Plus, the alleged assassination plot. I would want to play the video of the meetings. I order that the respondent be held at Mudaiga police station for five days. Dennis Itumbi's case further exposes the divide in Jubilee. And Molo MP goes to an event championing against alcoholism, but... NTV Tonight with Mark Masai and Smriti Vidyarthi. We're glad you could join us on NTV Tonight. Flora Tieno is a sign language interpreter. Now to a top story in friends and family of the late Safaricom chief Bob Collymore offered a rare glimpse into his life. At a service held in his memory at the All Saints Cathedral, each speaker described him as a man who touched and changed the lives of those he interacted with. President Huru Kenyatta, diplomats and other dignitaries were among those present. Our Leila Mohammed was there too. Intimidate me to call him father. There was the laughter. <laughs> and even more. My one disappointment, I was supposed to have gone back collect something that had been reserved for a special friend. The last act was a solemn ceremony. A few dignitaries, family and friends gathered in a collective sense of loss. But even in the moments of celebration... To the only man whom I loved and desperately wanted to live forever. Bob's story was still penned with the ink of affliction. His widow struggling to break down the wall of emotion to celebrate and honor the memory of her husband. Her reflections, a mirror of his own voice. A person's a person, no matter how small. And the thing is, you're never too small to make a difference in this world. In just two pages, a great man who lived in this country for less than a decade was celebrated in a picture gallery to astounding ovation and so many somber memories of him. The man who was at the helm of one of the country's most profitable organizations also made time for friends, a strong bond that even death will not serve her. What a great example and lesson for all of us here today. The president, Colimo's broken promise to hang on to the company for another year still hurts. He will, however, not break his promise to take care of the family he leaves behind. Bob loved Safaricom as if it was his own, a part of his family. And Bob loved his wife and his children dearly. It was the final chapter of a story about a candle that never flickered, even in the wind. A man whose spirit remains immortalized in the world he left. Leila Mohammed, NTV. Alive. A befitting ceremony there for a legend. May the soul of Bob Collymore always rest in peace. Two other stories now. Making headlines, Faith Harrison Njeri, who until recently served in Ferdinand Waititu's government as chief finance officer, now accuses the former boss, uh, Governor, Kiambu, Governor of Kiambu, I beg your pardon, Ferdinand Waititu, of running the county of Kiambu like his own personal kiosk. Faith testifies that Waititu has indeed awarded tenders to his family and proxies as the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission suspects him of doing. And those are not the only crimes she accuses him of. NTV's Olive Burrows with more on the Kiambu County fallout. 
This dramatic arrest then released followed this bold statement earlier in the day. I don't feel under threat and we are not fearing because we are talking the truth. And an explosive revelation that offers a glimpse into the state of Kiambu County affairs. Faith Harrison Jerry, who has served as the chief finance officer under Kiambu Governor Ferdinand Waititu, now accuses her boss of presiding over a corrupt and incompetent administration that has been milking the county dry. All the tenders are awarded to the family members, the wife, son, and the proxies, of which is not supposed to be so according to the law. She and five other county staff blamed the governor for meddling and running a one-man show. Baititu, only weeks earlier, was himself bundled into a waiting vehicle by the authorities and taken in for questioning over the suspected irregular award of tenders valued at 588 million to himself and his immediate family. <laughs> The EACC also listing fraudulent acquisition of public funds, conflict of interest and money laundering, all of which his former chief finance officer says he is guilty of. The tenders are being awarded to the MCAs in the county. This is to suppress uh, the independence of the assembly. She also claims the governor has transferred public property to private individuals, listing staff houses and quarries. If government does not move in with speed and save the Wanchiko of Kiambu, uh, we are likely to dissolve this county the way the Taita Taveta government is moving on. Because if all the public properties have been acquired and transferred to the private individuals, I don't see Kiambu... Uh, uh, surviving. When reached for comment, Waititu advised Faith and Jerry to take her complaints to the EACC and not the media. Olive Burrows, NTV. Now, to more revelations, this time about guns in the wrong hands, the government says half of elected political leaders in the country are among 4,000 gun holders who failed to submit to the vetting exercise. Well, these gun owners, some of whom cannot be traced, were given a week to register their weapons, but are yet to comply. And as Seth Olale reports, the government says they will be declared armed and dangerous upon the expiry of the grace period that's tomorrow. <laughs> A huge number of MPs, senators, governors, women representatives and MCAs will be declared armed and dangerous upon the expiry of a seven-day grace period extended to gun owners to submit their guns and licenses for vetting. The legislators are among 4,000 people who the Firearm Registrations Bureau says the licenses will be rendered illegal after failing to turn up for the mandatory vetting exercise at the Directorate of Criminal Investigations headquarters along Kiambu Road. Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi has ordered those with fake certificates to surrender their firearms to the nearest police stations, and those who will not comply will be forcefully disarmed by security agencies. <laughs> They will also be arrested and charged with unlawful possession of firearms, a claim that attracts a punishment of seven years in prison. <laughs> Members of the public have occasionally complained of being harassed by a number of gun-wielding VIPs, such as members of parliament and businessmen. 
According to the new regulations, civilians who own firearms must be sufficiently trained in the use of small arms, have a certificate of clearance from the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, and be at least 21 years of age. They must also satisfy the Firearms Registration Bureau and the sub-county police commander that the nature of the business or occupation they are engaged in puts the life in danger. The entire process can take up to two months and cost 2,000 shillings. For the current vetting, however, gun holders must satisfy the Firearms Registration Bureau that they can use a gun efficiently through taking a test at a shooting range. Additionally, they must take a mental test carried out by an approved government doctor. The gun has to be subjected to a ballistics test and the DCI to ascertain that it has not been used in any crime. Prohibited firearms include automatic and semi-automatic self-loading military assault rifles such as G3s, AK-47s and M16 rifles. Seth Olale, NTV. Well, for more details on that story, grab your copy of the Daily Nation tomorrow, where you can also read on a special report. History changed forever in July 1969. For much of humanity, eyes were firmly fixed on the skies. Far above them, for eight days, starting on the 16th, three men left the bounds of Earth on their way to set foot on the moon, where no human had ever been before. Well, in Kenya, though eyes and thoughts were not cast skywards, 10 days before the moon landing, all attention was on a little patch of ground on a small island on Lake Victoria. On 10th July 1969, Tom Boyle was buried on Rosinga Island. Five days before that, on a Saturday afternoon in Nairobi, Tom Boyer had walked into a chemist shop. He had bought a bottle of lotion and chatted to the chanists and uh, the proprietors of the pharmacy. He had then stepped out straight into a gunman who fired two bullets into him. Boyer was uh, dead within the hour. Don't miss your copy of the Daily Nation tomorrow for this special report. Now to another story that we highlighted and Irony played out rather dramatically uh, today in El Bergon, where the Molo Member of Parliament, that's uh, Kimani Kuria, was kicked out of a public forum which was advocating against alcoholism because they say that he was drunk. <laughs> well, when he arrived and began to address the public, he opted to get closer by jumping over meshed fence. There he is, only helped by people on the other end. Well, the residents expressed disappointment in the young MP, saying that he had set a bad example for the youth as well as fallen short of the title Honourable or Meshu Miwa. Yeah, quote-unquote Mwejimiwa there. Molo Deputy Commissioner David Wanyonyi had to intervene and take the legislator away. Some of the youth still cheered him on even as he left. I guess he feels the pain of the or the plight of those he's trying to help. That is MP Kuria. We'll try to get him to get his side of the story. Probably a sober one. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, to story, we mentioned that we will be having on the Daily Nation tomorrow the story just to take you back in time to 69 uh, where Tom Boyer was assassinated. Well, there's that story now on a different note. State House Digital Communications Director Dennis Itumbi now claims to have proof that a meeting that discussed the deputy president's assassination happened. Itumbi told the court that he had audio and video recordings of the said meeting at the Lamada Hotel. And as NTV's Silas Apollo reports, Itumbi will spend the next five days in custody to allow police for more time for investigations. After close to 24 hours under the watch of police officers in cells, Controversial blogger Dennis Itumbi was finally arraigned today. Itumbi is facing charges of forging the letter alleging the assassination of Deputy President William Ruto. And in solidarity with him today were MPs allied to the Deputy President. To him the prosecution believes that he was responsible for publishing the said letter, but he denies the claims and instead claims to have an audio and video recordings of the meeting that allegedly took place at the Lamada Hotel. I would want 
to play because it would assist the whole of this thing they are trying to investigate. The video of the meetings, because it would prove that a member of uh, a member who works for my bosses has actually threatened the life of the deputy president. Itumbi claims he was told to admit to authoring and posting the letter when he was arrested Wednesday afternoon. The prosecution told the court that it intends to expand its investigations to a WhatsApp group consisting of governors, senators, MPs and other politicians allied to the deputy president and which they said later was forwarded to. Part of its investigations will include the summoning of the members of the group named Tanga Tanga. The prosecution had wanted it to be detained for 14 days, but his defense strongly objected, saying they had had enough time to tighten up the investigations. I order that the respondent be held at Mudaiga police station for five days to enable the completion of the investigations. Itumbi was arrested by detectives from the DCI after investigations narrowed down to two aides in the office of the deputy president said to have authored the letter. Silas Apollo, NTV. Well, in what is now a new source of friction within the Jubilee Party, MPs allied to Deputy President William Ruto maintain the assassination plot against him is real and cannot be ignored. On the other side of this divide are MPs allied to the President who have dismissed the assassination plot, calling on the Deputy President to take responsibility for spreading falsehoods. Mel Miendo has more on the unfolding intrigues within Jubilee. The discord within the Jubilee party has been underlined in public. The deputy president's assassination plot is the new source of strife, exposing the fault lines in the wobbly architecture of power. Dennis Itumbi, who once worked in the State House digital media team, then moved to the office of the deputy president, is seemingly at the very center of the divide. And in court, he had an army of supporters, mostly made up of members of parliament allied to the deputy president. Dennis Itumbi has just revealed in court that now there is video evidence available that confirms that indeed there was a meeting and the words that have threatened and have begun all this, uh, all this process were uttered by a government officer. That is where we expect DCI to focus his attention on and nothing else. But on the other side of the political aisle, those openly opposed to the DP's ambitions under the Kieleweke umbrella have called on the DP to take responsibility for what they say are untrue assassination claims. Deputy President be probed to ascertain what he knew about this fake assassination plot. This is because he is the one who introduced the idea that there was a plot by cabinet ministers to assassinate him. However, he then refused to make a formal statement with the DCI on these allegations. In what has framed the relations between the members of the larger Jubilee House, both sides have for most part kept their gun barrels trained on each other. So we want to categorically tell the DCI that stop chasing squirrels in the name of fake letters and go for the antelope that is the plot to assassinate none other than the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. We expect the Deputy President to make a public apology uh, to Kenyans on causing them such anxiety based on false falsehood at the very least. The President is yet to pronounce himself on the goings-on within his house, nor made any attempt to pick up the raptured pieces of the party and piece them back together, despite growing calls for him to do so. Mel Miendo, NTV. All right, you've been watching NTV tonight. It's 20 past the hour. Time for a quick breather, but as always, this is what you can expect in just a moment. Coming up, Huduma number clerks cry for their dues and the bigger problem of youth unemployment. AMG Realtors presents you Nanyuki Heavens Phase 2. Buy a plot at 270,000 and save 70,000. Book a plot with 50,000. Balance in two months. All cash.
Now you're watching NTV Tonight. Here's a quick recap of our top stories. Late Safaricom Chief Bob Collymore was remembered as a man who touched every life he came into contact with the family and friends and a few dignitaries gathered at the All Saints Cathedral to celebrate a life well lived. Faith Harrison Njeri, who served as Chief Finance Officer in Kiambu County, resigned alongside five other county officials, accusing Governor Ferdinand Waititu of meddling, running a one-man show and awarding tenders to his cronies. One-time Digital Communications Director at State House Dennis Itumbi now claims he had video and audio recordings of the meeting where the DP's assassination was discussed. He will be spending the next five days in custody. All right, those are just some of the headlines in case you missed those stories earlier. But moving on, the Nyeri County Referral Hospital and the Quarantina Level 4 hospitals are grappling with an influx of patients from the neighboring Kirinyaga and Laikipia counties where medical services have been paralyzed for the last one month. The hospital has registered 100% bed occupancy, with more than half coming from Kirinyaga. The budget set for the hospital is stretched, even as the hospital staff have been forced to work long hours to contain the situation. Melito Letengas reports. This is the situation in Karatina Level 4 Hospital in Nyeri County. An influx of patients seeking treatment here after health services in the neighboring Kirinyaga and Laikipia counties were paralyzed for the last month owing to health workers' strike. Janet Wamboi tells us that her brother is admitted at the hospitals after frequent and futile visits to the Kerugoya Hospital. <laughs> The painstaking process of visiting the patients in hospital on a daily basis also continues to take a toll on their loved ones. According to the hospital director Caroline Gishuki, the health facility has been overwhelmed by the number of patients, but they are working to manage the situation. Our budget is overstretched because the consumables that we had at the, at the time of the strike and the effect it has had on our facility has gone up and the, con the consumption rate of course is higher. So the, the, the consumables we had in store may not take us to the period that we thought it would cover. A similar situation plays out at the Nyeri County Referral Hospital. Hundreds of patients have lined up to see a doctor. The long queues too strenuous for some to bear. They choose to lie on the grass as they await their turn. The influx of patients from the neighboring counties adds to a high number of patients that was registered since the introduction of universal health coverage in the county last year. Melita Oletenges, NTV. And now to the burden on the unemployed, which is mostly youth. And it is no secret that the state of unemployment in the country, and especially among the youth, nears tipping point. For these faces of the unemployment crisis, they hope for better, but fear the government has taken a tone-deaf approach to their plight. And V's Zainab Ismail with the despairing state of the youth. When Joseph Maina graduated from Kenyatta University with a bachelor's degree in accounting and finance in 2017, he was not fully prepared for the hostile job-seeking environment he was entering. For the whole day, like six hours a day, I spend my time looking for jobs. Like many young people, Joseph now joins the list of those who hope to fall upon a chance in the job market by advertising their state on social media, hoping to catch the eye of a potential employer. We meet this group of young men at Nairobi's industrial area. They are not sunbathing. They pensively wait here in the hope of landing casual work from the factories around here. Their frustration is unmistakable. They have been here since dawn and by noon there was no reprieve in sight. Papa, 
jua kali ikiwa na Twitter tunaenda lakini tukikosa tunakaa vile umetuona hivi. Ingawa tunakujanga asubuhi unakaa hadi jioni hatupati kazi. Sasa zingine labda matrela zikikuja tunashukisha. Unakaa hata hujakula lunch. Last week a multitude of young and unemployed Kenyans attended a job interview at a hotel in the capital where a recruitment agency had advertised for five vacant positions of waiters and waitresses. The response was overwhelming even for the agency. The state of unemployment has driven thousands to the Middle East in search of better opportunities and while some thrive, for many others it marks the start of a new journey of misery having to endure cruelty and abuse in the hands of their employers. According to the latest findings released by research firm Infotruck, unemployment tops the list of concerns among Kenyans with high cost of living and corruption featuring high up. Zainab Ismail, NTV. Elsewhere, some of the clerks who worked in the Huduma number registration project say that they are yet to receive their payment as agreed for the long hours they put in to realize the government's digital registration dream. Charity Mwangi spoke to one of them who requested for anonymity on account of the threats they continue to receive from their supervisors who warned them against making the issue public. The government exerted a great push for the registration of Huduma number, even as some statements were viewed as threats. The pressure was on, and a significant part of it was on the shoulders of the clerks who worked long hours to beat the deadline. But now, some are decrying unpaid dues. <laughs> And we went 50 something days. We had to do our jobs. When we took leave at 20k, then 16,000. Alafu ikafika hapo na wakanyamaza. The speaker, who will remain anonymous for security purposes, says they have been warned against publicly addressing the issue or risk being blacklisted from any other government projects. The Huduma Number Project Coordinator, Philip Lemarasha, says payment was done in three phases. The first one, 20,000 shillings, was paid out after 20 days. The second one has already been effected. He adds that the payment of the third tranche is currently ongoing. Those who lost or damaged their kids will, however, be surcharged. Ma, sisi tuliambua tufungue group ya WhatsApp, ya Huduma, na tukafungua. Sasa kuna wale maofishios uh, wa serikali ya mbao wako kwa hiyo group. Sasa wale walikuwa wakubwa wetu. Sasa hizi tukiwauliza maswali, wawu wandoka kwa group. Hata kitukiwa ali cha mguvu, pia wanaondoka. He remembers the tough shift they had to work through, more so at the tail end of the project. Maukweli, ata haikuwa human, ata all at all. Juna ingia kazi six, kazi ni mchana mzima mpaka jioni samoja. Tulikuwa tunaacha kufanya kazi kamera ziki, acha kukapcha pictures. Akukuwa na lunch, akukuwa na allowance yeyote, aupewe ata siku moja ya kukuwa off. Pressure ya makeleleza watu. He feels that the government has failed in solving the country's unemployment problem and appears to be misusing dejected unemployed youth. Kwangu, kama sahi mimi nilikata kwa apply yo census. Ju, awezi pangia yo pesa. Ata ni heli utafute kibarua, mahali utafata kibarua. Ata kama ni pesa kidogo, lakini ni pesa ambayo utawela budgetia. Unajua ni utaipata dini. Na, okay, ni vizuri vijana wa apply, lakini mtu asikuwe na that high expectation. The telecommunication house was one of the registration centers. The memory of the long queues witnessed here and in other registration centers across the country is still fresh amongst Kenyans. The professionalism of these clerks is told by the way they handled the queues and beat the deadline. It is, however, unfortunate that the government has failed in meeting their end of the deal. Charity Mwangi, NTV. All right, a story that we will be following up on. Now to our grand report. And has the president lost his grip on the presidency and the country? Well, going by the findings of an opinion poll conducted by InfoTrack, a number of Kenyans blame him for not steering the country in the right direction. From the executive that acts in isolation to parliament that is undermined by supremacy wars 
and the judiciary suffering under its own spell, the government is slowly degenerating into an organ on a perpetual war with itself, and not even the cabinet, under collective responsibility, can sit and deliberate. Ken Majunga reports that it's a bad shape inside the government's tent, even as the president seemingly employs a see-no-evil, hear-no-evil approach. The president's interaction with his deputy at today's function perhaps offers a glimpse into their relationship in private. In the past, the president has made statements that have left no doubt as to who the message was intended for. You can be my brother. You can be my sister. You can be my closest political ally. You can be <laughs> whatever you are. Sometimes they are not so explicit, but still they raise no doubt. By the way, you've just been given an offer of one. I have a couple more I'd like to donate to you. <laughs> At least for the next three years, give me peace. <laughs> the shoots of rebellion within his own house perhaps started to sprout after the handshake that the president hoped would give him peace and space to thrive, but instead caused fractures at the heart of power. What was once a cold war is now an all-out battle. The lines of division have also cut through the cabinet. Its members have openly picked sides. Reports of some cabinet secretaries avoiding cabinet meetings abound, even though the cabinet last sat weeks ago. Just last week, four members of the cabinet were accused of plotting against the DP, by far the most serious of allegations to grip the cabinet. And it's also intended to injure our reputation. To the extent that that government is dysfunctional, as we've said, we must tell the president that, uh, please, this is not it. And it's not just the cabinet suffering. The legislators, too, are squabbling. As early as last year, parliament was under the spell of the executive, in fact, renegade members of parliament were dealt with. They were either de-whipped or removed from key positions. There is nobody that we will allow to dictate to parliament in terms of how they will do their business, how they will run their programs. Parliament is an independent institution. The sibling rivalry, however, started during the 11th parliament. The Supreme Court had to intervene in a dispute between the National Assembly and the Senate on the division of revenue bill. This supremacy contest between the two houses of parliament now threatens to shut down county operations. The Senate has no powers to remove you from office. Tell these characters that we are beyond intimidation. For somebody to say that Senate is an idle institution, that kind of person did not take a proper oath. The judiciary that is also expected to mediate has also had its fair share of challenges. The chief justice is also under siege. If not from independent petitioners wanting him out, his own subordinates casting aspersions, the DCJ faces imminent prosecution following allegations of impropriety and abuse of office. One of the Supreme Court judges is under investigations by a tribunal. Countless more in the lower courts are under investigations. Yeah. Government is their own people. This government is going to punish you more than they will punish me. I'm telling you, in another one year... All this while the president remains unmoved, even as his own party faces an acrimonious split. Observers say only he wields the stick. He only needs to use it. Ken Mijungu, NTV. Early on, we posed this very question to a section of Kenyans across the country and asked whether they thought the country was headed in the right direction. And here's what some of you had to say. Uongozi yake haitupeleki vizuri vile kwa sababu kama saa hii ni kama wanategana na naimbu yake na Ibulais Ruto hasa watu hata mwananchi hajui kama ni kieleweke ama nitagataga sio hata mwananchi amechanganyika hajui inaendeleaje kwa hii Kenya tuko sawa ukiliganisha na wakati ya Kibaki saa hii iko mzuri kabisa kwa sababu ukiangalia barabara reli ziko yani tunaona kazi inafanyika na maendeleo na iko tu na iko sawa kabisa Sisi nikasema rais ameshindwa na kazi sababu tangu tuanze na 2013 mpaka wa leo sitaona mahali amelekea na kazi yake ni ile tu wale wale wandani wake wenye yako nao karibu ndio kidogo naona kuna ulekefu ya kuziki sana pia akisema hili hawa ni kama waoni Apparently the president is so much to the development of the nation and he wants things running 
People should stop politics and people should work on how to develop this our country. He is not in control because first of all, as the president, he represents the presidency as an institution and he should not, first of all, go around shouting in his mother tongue, yet you're representing the views of the entire nation. It's time for another breather, but uh, here's what's coming up in the business news. The government says it will open the duty-free window soon, but is it averting a crisis or is it aiding the cartels? Details up next with Dan Wangi. bags of maize in the coming weeks to meet the shortfall of the commodity in the country as stocks run out. These imports are intended to not only stabilize supply but also influence the price of maize meal downwards. But as Victor Kiprop reports, this 12 million figure is more than double what was recommended by the Strategic Food Reserve. Appearing before the Senate Committee on Agriculture on Monday, Chief Administrative Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Andrew Tuimur, indicated that the government was preparing to allow duty-free importation of at least 12.5 million bags of maize to cushion consumers from the increases in the price of maize meal. We've taken the necessary measures. We're just waiting for the final approval so that it's given for us to import. And we're going to import about 12.5 million bags. Uh, 10 million uh, white maize and 2.5 million of yellow maize. But in a shock admission, the Strategic Food Reserves now says it only recommended the importation of 4 million bags because that's all the country needs to plug the deficit. I doubt whether government can bring in 12 million between now and September. I doubt it. We don't consume so much maize. We, we have advised about 4 million bags. According to the ministry, the duty-free window will be open between late July and end of October, but the FSR thinks otherwise. We think that uh, the month of July and August are critical 
but uh, uh, right from September, we should have enough uh, uh, maize being harvested and uh, 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 Kenyans will not uh, have a problem. Kenya's annual maize consumption stands at about 52 million bags against a production of about 39 million bags, but experts argue that this year's harvest could be hit by the invasion of the fall armyworm and the erratic rainfall experienced early this year. Victor Kiprop, NTV Business, Naro. From maize to sugar, and the country continues to rely heavily on imported sugar to supply the high demand of the sweetener with imports increasing by 15% last month compared to a corresponding period last year. And as Lillian Kerry reports, with a myriad of challenges bedeviling the sector, Kenyans say the only way to save the industry is to stop the imports. While the importation of sugar into the market is essentially supposed to increase the volumes, lower the demand and essentially reduce the cost on the shelves, this has not been the case. At the beginning of the year, a kilogram of sugar retailed at 112 shillings. The price declined in March to retail at 107 shillings per kilogram. In April, the graph changed and saw the sweetener average at 108 shillings per kilogram. By May, the price of sugar on the shelf had shot up to 115 shillings per kilogram. The latest data from the Sugar Directorate indicates that the volumes shipped in the country in May stood at 21,911 tons compared to 19,081 tons imported in the same period last year. This was an increment of 15%, which has been attributed to the decline of table sugar imports last year due to huge stocks of cheap, duty-free sugar. The situation has angered some Kenyans who are faulting the poor performance of the local industries on the government's reluctance to act, opting for an easier way out. Kuleta sukari kutoka inja hayuwezi saidia. Iyo ndiyo chanzo cha kuangusha kampuni zetu ambazo zinapatikana maeneo haya. Kuna tu baadhi mabwenyenye wanazuia sukari ya hapa ya, ya kwetu western au wanatoa masukari huko nje nje na wanafaidika. On the other hand, total production of sugar in May was 214,395 metric tons compared to 231,417 metric tons which was achieved in the same period last year. This signified a drop of 7%, which was buoyed by the performance in local sugar factories such as Nzoia, Chemilil and South Nyanza and the continued closure of Mumias and Kwale International Sugar Companies. Lillian Kiarie, NTV. The National Assembly has approved President Uhuru Kenyatta's proposal to have the Kenyan National Shipping Line operate at the second container terminal at the port of Mombasa. This comes after President Kenyatta rejected the first version of the bill to amend the Merchant Shipping Act 20, or 2009, I beg your pardon, that would have given powers to private entities to enjoy full privileges of operations at the terminal. And as NTV's Kevin Mutai reports, the Kenya Ports Authority supports the move, saying it will open windows for more business ventures. The comeback of the Kenya National Shipping Line into play and run its functions at the second container terminal is a move the government now argues will see the proceeds of the port diverted back to boosting the country's economy. But this has been met with a lot of criticism, especially from the coast leaders who argue that the 27 billion shillings project will not benefit Kenyans as they wanted. We are seeing now an opportunity where someone can simply be able to come and offer shares of 3%, 2% to government and run terminals. We are asking ourselves, where are they going to get this business? When for the last 10 years, they have been only doing 18% of the business at the port of Mombasa. The president had his way after the MPs failed to lobby for the required number needed to overturn the president's memorandum to the floor of the house. The MPs led by Mvita legislator Abdul Somad Nasir had introduced an amendment to the Merchant Shipping Act that sought adjustments to fully allow Kenya National Shipping Line or any other shipping company operate the second container terminal. Some shipping lines which are almost enjoying monopoly, almost enjoying exclusive operations at the coast, we want them to come and appear before my committee and to explain to us what legal structures did they use 
to be able to get those those exclusive rights. Kenya Ports Authority and MSC owns 53% and 47% of shares respectively. And now it means that other privately owned entities, including foreign shipping companies, will now have to enter into stiff competition in business for both imports and exports. This will also promote the campaign on the blue economy as it will attract more investors who will use the port of Mombasa as a transshipment hub. Kevin Muntai, NTV, Mombasa. There is need for African governments to rethink the priority accorded to technology in policy formulation if the continent is to optimize on the opportunities presented by emerging trends. According to a new report by the Tony Blair Institute, the continent needs an adaptive policy framework which takes into consideration the increasingly significant role that technology plays. So when I was in government, you know, technology was another subject alongside health, education, law and order, industry, uh, infrastructure, right? Today, technology is gonna transform all of those things. So the risk is that, that not just here in Kenya and not just here in Africa, but globally, that there is a gulf of understanding between the people driving this change in the technology sector and the policy makers who find a lot of this difficult to understand and comprehend. Now, over 200 exhibitors drawn from 22 countries have converged at the Kenyatta International Convention Center, that's KICC, for the 22nd Build Expo Africa, an event which showcases various manufactured products with a bias towards the building and construction industry. The dominant countries at the exhibition this year are Germany, China, Portugal, India, and South Africa. But on walking around the grounds, one is hit by the forceful presence of the Chinese. The three-day event runs up to Saturday. The expo is, take, is taking place at a time when the government is seeking to rope in more private sector players to contribute towards its affordable housing plan, which is part of the Big Four agenda. Some of the SME companies, it's about the awareness of the government projects or stuff like that. Maybe the SME companies just need to have a way through. Maybe the government can provide an initial initiative where we can have a breakthrough into these projects. The government part is just uh, to make sure that the houses are being built in the right way. Or any infrastructure is coming up in the right way, the right chemicals. Because you know so many people don't, go to the, don't use the right chemicals and later come to regret later. And I would like to urge the business people, the business uh, community to come here because we have the latest technology in different se sectors. That's it for business. My name is Dan Mongi. Have yourself a good night. But still coming up. Nyandara County to set funds aside to build a bridge where a log has held fort. Okash is the quickest and easiest way to request short-term loans from your mobile phone whenever you need them. You can borrow up to 50,000 Kenya shillings in one day and choose between a 14 or 28 day term to repay it at a fair interest rate that adjusts to your needs. Okash connects seamlessly with your m -Pesa account to facilitate and speed up your loan requests. Download Okash today from Google Play Store and...
Thank you for staying with us. The county government of Nyandarwa says it will set aside 8 million shillings for the construction of a bridge that connects Kahoda and Ngamini villages. Well, this is after NTV highlighted the plight of pupils at Wangoi Primary School who risk their lives every morning crossing a one-tree slippery bridge before making it to school. The county government has also sent a team of engineers to survey the site and come up with a design for permanent footbridge. On Wednesday, NTV highlighted the plight of pupils of Wangoi Primary School in Daragua who braved the morning breeze to cross a one-tree slippery bridge before making it to school. The miners are forced to hold hands to increase stability as they strive to make it to the next village heading to school. The older ones carry their juniors on their backs to help them make it to the other end. Today, county government officials, including Nyandarwa County Executive in charge of roads and his health counterpart, Dr. Njoroge Mungai, made a tour of the controversial bridge. Residents claim they have rescued a number of school-going children who have slid into the river. The county government of Nyandarwa has set aside 8 million shillings for the construction of a proper bridge to connect Kahuda and Ngamini villages. We even get scared of our children who are using that bridge and even anyone who may dare to cross along that bridge. We shall sit down to see to it that uh, uh, we look for funds to see and find a lasting solution to the bridge that we have set. A team of engineers who will be in charge of designs, materials, procedure and safety precautions are already on the ground. The project will take close to six months. <laughs> It's now time for sports, and this is what's coming up. The national football team is back home after its AFCON exit. Find out what lessons they learnt in Egypt after the break. Buy a plot at 270,000 and save 70,000. Book a plot with 50,000. Balance in two months. All cash buyers will get another plot absolutely free. AMG Realtors. Integrity. When the spirit of Kenya got going that magical day, it never looked back. And now, the same spirit is ready to take Kenya to the next level. Led proudly by a new generation. Kenya King, Shangilia, Hasolia, Kenya. You will never find no one in this night. This week on The Trend, the legendary Jack Cure will be here. in the country after they returned home early today morning. football, either you win or either you lose. So to learn from those mistakes that we make, to our next qualifier, we rectify on those mistakes. We believe Kenya to na with good, good investment and proper guidance to Nazarbali. Me going there tournament, Roger. Come on, I'm make a way. I'm the chess tournament. Come on, you're gonna be a Pia Kidogo, Tona Kuna Woga, Makuna Zoe Fukidogo, 
hakuna lakini tunashukuru kwa ile mechi ya pili tuli, tulijaribu kadri uwezo wetu na pia tatu pia tukajaribu lakini haikukua vile tuko nataka ikue uh, ni tunasema tu pole kwa mafans mpira ni naweza sema kwamba mpira ni mchezo ambao mtu haizi sema mpira ni, ni mchezo ambao ni, una makosa mengi na mostly ikitokea kwa goalkeeping tipo kila mtu anaiona yeah. yeah, lakini huko kwingine ikitokea mtu aiona no. light of a goalkeeper patrick matasi there with uh, his reasons for his performance at afcon and on to athletics and lekipia airbase are the overall winners of the 40th edition of the kenya defense forces championship that came to a close at the kasarani stadium earlier today lekipia won 10 goals followed by nanyuki with 8 goals as moi airbase was third with 6 goals world 5000 meters champion helen obiri was victorious in the women's 10000 meters after three days of action, the Kenya Defense Forces Championships has come to an end. World 5,000 meters champion Helen Obiri won 10,000 meters race in a time of 31 minutes and 43 seconds. World half marathon record holder Joycelyn Depkosge came in second with Irene Kamaise third. I didn't have enough experience. I had to go. As you can see, the other day I traveled from US, it's a long journey, and I've not recovered well. So I try, maybe I can just try and do 10K. In the 5,000 meters, Peter Ndewa was victorious in a time of 13 minutes and 31.4 seconds, ahead of Linus Maruka and Frederick Chebe. <laughs> Charles Simoto won 1,500 meters men in a time of 3 minutes and 40.1 seconds. Matthew Kipsang and Ivan Kipchumba completed the podium places. In women's race, Winchebet won in a time of 4 minutes and 19.2 seconds. And she was followed by Jarinta Mawia and Masi Wanjiru. Benjamin Kigeni was the winner in 3,000 meters steeplechase after clocking 8 minutes and 22.2 seconds. <laughs> Kennedy Njiru was second and Festas Kiprono third. KDF feels it has selected a strong team for the National Athletics Championship, which will be held in August. <laughs> The Nationals will be used to pick the team to fly Kenya's flag at the World Championships in Doha, Qatar. Yoshua Makori, NTV Sport. The tug of war is always a delight in the military games. And uh, following years of uh, preparation and with a heavy government investment, the eyes of the motorsport world will be on the Kasarani Stadium Friday morning when President Uhuru Kenyatta flags off the cars competing in the 2019 Safari Rally. Sean Kadovilis with the details. 48 vehicles have been cleared for the 2019 Safari Rally that is a candidate event for the 2020 World Rally Championship as well as a round of the Africa Rally Championship. Reigning two-time Africa champion Manvir Barian will be first off the ramp at 11 a.m. leading the 48 entries. He will be followed by defending champion and five-time winner Carl Flash Tundo. Double Safari Rally winner Boldev Chaga will be fourth off the ramp, while starting fifth is the only driver to have won the Safari Rally as a WRC in 1994, Ian Duncan. Kenya's first indigenous crew of Eric Bengi and Tutumionki start in ninth position. The ceremonial start will be flagged off by President Uhuru Kenyatta, after which spectators will catch a glimpse of the competing cars at speed around the opening 4.5 km super special stage outside the Kasarani Stadium. The cars will then head to Naivasha for an overnight park permit at Sopa Lodge. Amazing um, the way this thing has been laid out and I think we can, we, we can all say it quietly and sort of um, confidently, WRC, WRC is coming home. The organisers are not taking chances as they seek a return for the event to next year's World Rally Championship with the second stage of the opening day being cancelled due to continuous rains in the forest stage. 
Sean Carter Villas, NTV. The WRC is coming home, hopefully. And uh, Kenyan Winter Olympian Sabrina Wanjiko has received a boost after the National Olympic Committee of Kenya committed to help her prepare for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. In the build-up to the Winter Games, Sabrina is set to take part in the World Cup and World Championships in Italy next year. I represent Kenya. Um, I'm like an ambassador, almost. And, um, yeah, I... I hope I will get the support also from the government. Um, yeah, I, I'm proud to be a Kenyan. And um, the, when I'm ski racing, um, the people are always looking and, what's a Kenyan girl ski, ski racing? They don't really understand. And yeah, so um, I think it's really unique. And um, I, can, I think it's uh, also a unique ad advertisement for Kenya. <laughs> So um, I, I hope I will get the support from the government as well. Welcome home, uh, Sabrina. And our KCB winger Jacob Oje is a star time sports personality of the month of May, becoming the 23rd recipient of the award. Oje was instrumental as the bankers bagged their third consecutive Kenya Cup title by beating rivals Cabra Sugar in the final played at the Kakamega Showground. For his exploits, Oje received a star time 43-inch digital television set and 100,000 shillings. The Kenya Sevens captain edged out athlete Simon Cheprot, Ugandan rugby star, Philip Wokorach and a fitness buff Evelyn Okini. He's the home of champions and uh, winning is something that we had set out to do for a very long time. As we've just had the chairman state that we, we set out to win five, we've just done three. So the work is still uh, cut out for us, still have to work hard. Now onto a splash of color and the Sports for Change organization has partnered with the Nation Media Group and other organizations for this year's Color the Run event. The organization assists exemplary students who are financially challenged to complete the secondary and tertiary education in order to realize their full potential. Sports for Change held their signing off ceremony today at the Uhuru Gardens which was a vibrant display of color as members of the organization, beneficiary Beneficiaries of the program and Nation Media Group representatives toast colorful holy powder in the air to commemorate the start of the color run, which is set to be held on the 11th of August. We are happy to be working together, and this year we are promising to make it big with our brand NTV. And it's coming at a very special moment because uh, NMG just turned 60 years. NTV also is turning 20 years, 20 years of broadcasting. Right now I'm grateful for them and the, all the supporters of Sports for Change. Thank you. Ah, splash of color indeed. And the Peru advanced to the final of the Copa America and got a date with our hosts Brazil after beating double defending champions Chile. 3-0 Peru will play Brazil in the final at the Rio de Janeiro Zamaracana Stadium on Sunday seeking to win their first America since
Father Kira, good night to you too. And thanks to all of you for watching. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to Flora Atieno for the sign language interpretation. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. Good night. And Mark Masai says good night. It's like we're Thanks for watching.